Last week, I taught you the key difference between stress and anxiety and my top seven tips for effectively dealing with stress. You learned that while stress and anxiety are linked, they're actually two different states of being. And what you do to alleviate stress can actually make you feel more anxious. This week, we're focusing on my top tips to effectively tackle anxiety. So stay tuned to learn everything you need to know to reduce your anxiety and start living a more peaceful, joyful life. Welcome back. Hello. I always want to sing the Welcome Back Cotter song, but I think that's uh, aging myself. So those of you who don't know that song, I probably don't want to talk to you. Um, no, you're cute. Uh, <laughs> But the rest of us, older folk, we're laughing at the welcome back. Welcome back. I'm not going to sing it. So part two, are you ready? If you haven't listened to part one yet uh, about stress, it's really okay. This one stands alone. And I'm going to give you, of course, different information. And I really highly recommend that you listen to the one on stress because stress, you know, over time, chronic stress is what leads to anxiety. So, you know, you really have to take care of both. You have to take care of the stress in your life, which again are different things that you do, and you have to take care of the anxiety in your life if that's what you have. And we're gonna talk today also about even how to like kind of diagnose anxiety. Not that you're gonna diagnose yourself, but I'm gonna, you know, teach you some things about it. So, okay, so let, you know, let's just, Let's just jump in there. And might I say that a nice way to reduce anxiety would be to get my weekly love letter. <laughs> I mean it. <laughs> I'm really serious. It, it's, it would be a great way to reduce stress and anxiety. How do you like that? Because uh, all I do in the weekly love letter is send you love. I, it's, it's a story or a little whatever snippet or it, it's relatively short, it really is, few minute read and it's meant to inspire you for the week. It's meant to ha help you kind of reset and think differently. It's not, uh, you know, at this point, if you don't know that I'm not sleazy in any way, because I hate that shit, um, you know, it's, it's meant, it's a love letter and it's called that because it is. It's meant to bring you weekly love. And uh, I don't sell anything in there. I'm not gonna bombard you with emails or get sneaky, nothing happens. Uh, and you can unsubscribe on, on the weekly love letter very easily. So if you can, people sometimes reply and ask to be unsubscribed, you can do it yourself. It's, 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 it's as much time as it took to reply to ask to be unsubscribed, you can just do it. Um, it's right there at the bottom, it says unsubscribe. I'm, I'm thinking we'll even put something at the top anyway. Um, although if you ask me, I'm happy, you know, my, 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 my team will be happy to make that happen. Okay. So that's not even one of your tips. That's an extra. All right. And let, and by the way, since we're talking about anxiety, let's come to the space right now. What are you doing right this minute? Are you, you know, trying to do 15 things at once while you listen to me? Trust me, your anxiety, your stress is going up if you're doing that. I try to center as best you can if you're driving and listening or something. But if you're listening to me in the background while you're doing 20 other things, try to take a minute and just listen. It will help your anxiety. We know that when you're in the here and now, that's why mindfulness and meditation work for stress and anxiety. I'll talk about that today, actually. Um, that because you're in the here and now, you have less anxiety. I mean, that's just how it is. So anyway. I'll get to that in the tips though. Let us let let me just recap one small piece before I jump in, and that is the difference between stress and anxiety, in case you're listening to this for the first time, or just to have a little refresher, I just, and it's, it's quick. So, you know, again, I mentioned this last week, stress is a response to an external cause, and it recedes once that external issue is resolved. So, you know, something happens from the outside, it stresses you out, but once it goes away, it's away. You know, maybe you get a flat tire and you're stressed, but once you fix the tire and you're back on the road, you know, that goes away, that you're not still thinking about your flat tire, you know, all day. If you are, that's anxiety. Because anxiety is a reaction to stress, but it's an internal, it's an inside job, it's an internal issue. It's an anxiety, the, the definition is really a persistent or excessive worry that doesn't go away, even when there's no stressor there, even the, or whatever stressor you're originally worried about is gone. 
So since stress can trigger anxiety, keeping your stress level as low as possible is the first rule of thumb when you're dealing with your anxiety. And if you, so again, if you haven't checked out my top seven ways to effectively manage your stress, which was part one of this, it was last week's episode, uh, get to that as soon as possible. I'm going to, I cover all those, but for now, let's know that when we're under stress, our brains and bodies, uh, which again, I mentioned have a, like a series of chemical reactions that that affect obviously the brain and body, right? <laughs> All these reactions are going on. When we feel anxiety, it's like our brains and then our bodies are hijacked to a whole new level. And that's why what you do to deal with stress is often different than what you do to deal with anxiety because it's about unhijacking that brain. So let me, I'm just gonna do some quick biology, which is different than what I discussed last week because I need, I, I want to take this minute and talk about this because y- that way you can better understand and value the tips I'm about to give. Because some of the tips might seem like nothing or silly or it's too easy. They're too easy. That's what I hear a lot. It's too simple. It's not too simple if you understand what they're targeted at. So, and they're not strange. <laughs> Some people might've called them strange. Uh, But when you don't understand why they're needed, that's why. So I want to explain to you why they're needed. So I'm gonna do this very, very simply for any doctors or nurses listening now, you know, have some care. We're not trying to teach a medical class. We're just trying to give the bare bones of something so that enough to really understand what's happening. So, you know, you have a nervous system. I'm sure you've heard of that. You know that you have a nervous system. And your nervous system is made up of your your brain, your spinal cord, and all your nerves, okay? And your nerves, of course, send messages between your brain and the rest of your body. That's, That's how that all works. But your nervous system is actually made up of two different nervous systems. And those are your your voluntary nervous system and your involuntary. And I'm explaining things because we often assume we know what something is. Like, oh, I've heard of the nervous system, but did you know it was comprised of the spinal cord? You know, like, did you know what was in it? Now you do. So (laughs) you use your voluntary nervous system, I'm using it right now as I wave my hands around if you're watching me on YouTube. <laughs> I'm always talking with my hands. And, uh, you know, speaking, right? That's it's my voluntary nervous system. It's anytime I control my body movements. Anytime I'm doing that, I'm voluntarily, right, controlling something. But your involuntary is really what we're going to talk about today. Your involuntary nervous system is the one you're not in control of. And it's in charge of things like digestion and breathing and salivating and your eyelids blinking and all the things you don't have to think about, okay? That just happen automatically. Uh, you know, you're, it's why they you use the term autonomic nervous system also. You can hear that sometimes, your autonomic nervous system, you know. Uh, we're talking about, again, this involuntary, involuntary uh, ner- nervous system. That's, how, that's the language we're using. I know the language sometimes changes, so I don't want you to get confused. So that involuntary nervous system okay, has two different pathways in it. It has a relaxed one and an emergency one. And our the relaxed uh, pathway is our default or supposed to be the default. <laughs> so, but when there's, but when there's anything your brain perceives as a threat, which is just about everything, you'd be amazed how much your brain sees as a threat. Whenever that happens, it switches off of the relax, that the, def- the default, and it goes in your involuntary nervous system, right? The emergency part takes over instead of the relaxed part. The emergency system takes over. And what will happen is that stress hormones will flood your system and with a burst of energy because you needed to have energy to run. And those stress hormones, you know, cortisol, epinephrine, you know, uh, neuroadrenaline, all, all the things, right? they're all being in your system because if I'm running from a, from a, a, a tiger a uh, million years ago, whatever, <laughs> hopefully not now, unless you're hanging out, jumping in cages at the Bronx Zoo or something. Um, if I'm running from a tiger, I need this burst of energy, right? To run fast, to get away from this animal that's chasing me, this predator that's chasing me. And I all, well, the other thing that those uh, hormones and uh, neurotransmitters do is they help me focus on just getting away. I shouldn't be running from a tiger and also thinking about what I wanna cook for dinner, right? I I should have all of my energy here. And I'll explain why this part's important in a minute, but um, 
you know, you, your uh, heart rate beats faster, you know, to pump more blood, your breathing becomes, of course, more shallow and faster because you need to take in more air, right? Your lungs need to expand very quickly. Uh, your pupils become bigger to see in the dark. I don't know if you remember being on the playground when you were a kid, you know, and you'd run really, really fast from a dead stop and you'd get that pain in your chest or that, <laughs> that little stitch in your side, right? The, these hormones and neurotransmitters, these, these things that flood the system help you help alleviate all that stuff. So for example, there's endorphins and enkephalins that flood the system. They, the, their job is to relieve pain, anxiety, and stress. So when I'm running from something, I'm less stressed, right? I'm probably pretty stressed if a tiger or something's chasing me, right? So it's like a, your body's natural volume sort of, right? These endorphins and enkephalins. And they also alleviate, right, pain, so that stitch in my side, my lungs hurting goes away. And if any of you um, are, uh, you know, have talked about like a runner's high, if anybody, I don't run, it doesn't take that long to get from my couch to my refrigerator. But uh, if you're, my Gary does though, and if you're, or if you're exercising hard enough and you're like, you hit a wall, but then you get over the wall, right? You, you, and suddenly it's very easy to do. Those are those endorphins and enkephalins. You're actually, uh, having a, a, a centuries old, a millennial old uh, response. It's kind of cool, right? The, the, these are these vestiges of being, you know, kind of cave. I know we didn't live in caves, so get off my back, anthropologists. But you know what I mean? We, we say cave people, right? This time in our life so many years ago, homo sapiens first walking the earth, right? So we still have that. We, we haven't evolved that out. And that's where that all, but that's the original reason for it. Uh, and here it is now. So we have all of these different responses, right? And, and these responses were very well and good a million years ago when we were <laughs> running from predators, but now it gets in the way and I'll tell you how. So imagine you're at work, you know, it's 8 a.m. and your boss comes in and she says that she wants to see you at two. Hey, uh, I need to see you at two o'clock in my office <laughs> or on Zoom. You know what I'm talking about. You know the feeling. And, or let's say, um, let me give a good uh, relationship one. Oh, oh uh, you're, it's in the morning, right? You're noticing that your partner is acting a little cranky and you're thinking, oh, they're acting a little distant or cranky. And you say, hey, are you okay? Kind of offhandedly, because you think everything's fine. And they turn to you and go, well, actually, no. I have some things I really need to discuss with you, but I have to go to work right now. I've got a meeting. So, you know, we'll talk when I get home. <laughs> and they walk out the door. Ugh. I know. Can't you feel it right now? You can feel it. And here's what you're feeling. Do you know that feeling when your stomach drops out? You know what I'm talking about? You're, that sinking feeling in your stomach, that, get this, that is the blood rushing to your legs to run. All of those stress hormones have now flooded your system. They've come in because your brain sees this as a huge threat, either of these scenarios I just gave. Hopefully it don't happen the same day. And uh, you're Again, this 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 emergency response system takes over. You, it's involuntary. You have no control. It is taking over. Uh, you might start to sweat. Do you ever start to sweat when you're nervous or anxious? Well, that is you're sweating because you're supposed to be running, <laughs> and it's helping to cool your system when you run. It also serves that if a predator or maybe a, another person who was trying to kill you was a neighboring clan who would come over to, you know, kill you. Uh, if your skin is sweaty, it's harder to get purchase on it, right? It's harder to grab it and you might, the predator or the person might slide off. All of these things are happening. You might get, you notice that you're, sh you, for sure your breathing changes. It gets more shallow and anxious, right? Oh, I don't know what's gonna happen, right? That all starts to happen again because you're supposed to be running. <laughs> you're supposed to be running your way. Your brain goes into overdrive. It, it, it's trying to figure out what's wrong. And, and if you, what happens is that then you try to keep busy with something else. If you're at work, right, you try to go back to your Excel spreadsheet or if maybe you're at home and your partner left and you try to get yourself ready for work or you're trying to, I don't know, clean the kitchen or uh, whatever it is that you do when your partner's gone. And uh, if you notice, it's your brain keeps getting pulled back to your boss or your partner or whatever the thing was, right? You know, it's hard to concentrate. It's hard to stay on task. 
because if you were running, like I mentioned earlier, from a tiger, you're not supposed to do something else when you're doing that. All of your energy is supposed to be completely 100% focused on the danger. And while that emergency system is on, all of these things are happening. So yeah, it's hard to concentrate. It's hard to, your brain will just keep pulling you back to that situation that made you upset, right? Because you, you weren't supposed to stop thinking about it. You, right? Does this make sense? Okay. So a million years ago, running from a predator were, would have burned off. So all these stress hormones that are rushing through your system, if you had run from whatever the thing was or fought the person who was trying to kill you, it's a very physical, it's a huge physical outlay of energy. And you would have burned off the stress hormones that were being dumped in your system because you, as you ran for your life or fought to the death, right? But if you're standing there and your boss says, I'll see you in my office in a few hours, or your partner says, I'll talk to you later today, you're not running anywhere. You're not doing anything to burn off the stress hormones. So that's why it keeps flying around your body, telling you you should be worried and making you anxious and upset. You might notice again that you uh, aren't hungry, that you're, uh, and I have to blow my nose, I'm sorry. If you watch me on YouTube, there you go. Okay, so you might notice that you're not hungry. Again, that sinking feeling in your stomach. It's also because you're not supposed to eat when you're running from a tiger. You're not supposed to go, oh, is, is, is that a mango <laughs> hanging from that tree? I'm hungry, no. Uh, because uh, your body's number one process generally is digestion. So it's also why you're not hungry when you're sick because your body's trying to heal or run from a predator or whatever the thing is. It doesn't want you working on digestion, okay? And you're at your most vulnerable when you're digesting because your energy is there and you're, um, you know, you're slower. You're, you're going to be slower when that's happening. My nose is itching. Okay. Anyway, so does this all, this should make sense. I see you nodding your heads. Okay. The, right. So, but it, again, in, in today's world, in today, in our scenarios right now of chronic stress, you're not physically running from anything. Again, so those stress hormones aren't burning off and they're just rushing through your body and that stress becomes anxiety and, and you now feel anxious. And this is the reason that tips for stress often don't work for anxiety because your brain is hijacked and it's all about releasing your brain from that state first and then using your other great problem solving tools. And you know I'm telling the truth because you know the great tips Abby has taught you. And then when you're super anxious, do you notice how they fly out the window? You cannot remember a damn thing. You cannot remember a damn thing that I've ever taught you in that moment. And that's why later you're face palming like, oh, I should have this, or ooh, I can't believe I said that. Or how, how come I didn't remember X? Yeah, because of those hormones. So we have to, we have to unhijack the brain. We got, we got to sort of get, shift that energy first and then we can use all the fabulous tips. And that's really what I'm teaching you today. And hopefully even just that, knowing that, if you stop listening now, I think you would have, you have an aha moment. Like, oh, that's why that hasn't worked before. There you go. So here are my top five tips. I know I gave you seven for stress. Don't, don't get your panties in a twist. I understand. Here are my top five, but today get five. Tips for dealing with anxiety. And I, I the first one, okay. Tip number one is to, you got to get help, okay? Seek help. And it's not like for stress you wouldn't seek help. Yeah, you could seek help for that. You could ask people for help. Ask, tell them that you're feeling stressed about something, you know, that. Here I'm talking about I, anxiety is diagnosable. You know, there's no, it, it, stress isn't a diagnosis. It's sort of a, you know, I mean, it is and it's not. It, it's, it's not really diagnostic as far as like a mental health disorder. Stress is natural. It's a part of life. You know, everybody has stress. So there, but there is a mental health diagnosis for anxiety. And actually, there actually are a bunch of mental health diagnoses for anxiety. You know, we got social anxiety disorder, panic disorder, agoraphobia. I, I could name a million. I could sit here and just name them out. So I've mentioned before in the podcast, we use this big book called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders. Oh, oh, oh I have it. Wait. If you're watching on YouTube, <laughs> I'm 
I'm holding up the book if you're watching on YouTube. I'm not doing a good job though. You can't see it. Okay. Um, this is our big book. I just happened to have it out. Yeah, because I'm smart. I use my books. Okay. <laughs> you should use the book. So the DSM, as it's commonly called, we're in the fifth edition text revision, DSM 5TR. It has specific criteria that a qualified mental health professional, Google is not a qualified mental health professional. I know, I see you, I see you. A qualified mental health professional would use to make a formal anxiety diagnosis. So I'm gonna go over them here. I know, I'm gonna tell you the criteria here, but I wanna be clear that you should never diagnose yourself. If you're concerned, you should make an appointment to meet with a psychiatrist, right, to get diagnosed. And or, and I will say this, or another qualified mental health professional, okay? Your primary care physician, and I've said this before on the show, I love them, I love you primary care physicians, but this is not who should be diagnosing your anxiety. And what's happened is that because insurance companies here in the United States anyway, hopefully this isn't true in other countries, I didn't look this up before, in the United States insurance companies didn't like paying for psychiatrists because they cost more money. And they were like, oh, your, you know, your regular primary care physician can just, you know, your general practitioner can prescribe these meds and they can. The problem is they're not a specialist. And I would say to you this, if you had uh, cancer, would you go to your primary care physician or would you want a specialist, an oncologist? Yeah. If you had heart disease, would you see a cardiologist or would you just go, oh, my primary care physician's fine. This is an example of how mental health, especially here in the United States, is seen as like a throwaway and not important. And it's fucked up. It is fucked up. You know, I don't swear much, but it is fucked up. It pisses me the hell off. It pisses me off. You can feel my anger. Because I am here now because so many people, I'm having this talk with you because you don't have access to good health care often or true research-based information. If I told you how many doctors I speak to that I end up having to educate because they don't even know half the shit I'm telling you because it's not their specialty and I don't, I don't blame them. It's okay to not know. What's not okay is to pretend you know and to be consulting with your patients as if this is your expertise. That's what pisses me off, okay? That's what pisses me off. And so, can you tell? A psychiatrist is a medical doctor. They went to medical school just like all of your regular, uh, you know, your primary care physician, like your oncologist, like any of any MD, medical doctor, went all went to medical school. A psychiatrist just has specialty training in psychiatry. That's their specialty. Like your heart is a cardiologist or a neurologist or anything else. We call it a psychiatrist, okay? A PhD like me is someone who uh, we are not, we're called doctors, but we're not that kind of doctor. That's why I'm always like, you know, I throw around the Dr. Abby sometimes, but usually not. Like I don't have my clients call me that or anything. And if I'm somewhere... You know, if I'm a, a boarding a plane, you know, and they ask, you know, for your prefix, I don't put doctor there because I don't want anyone thinking I'm going to, you know, <laughs> uh, take care of someone who's having a heart attack on a plane. You know what I mean? Like, I'm very clear of what I am. And, and I'm always very honest, too, by the way, and I'll say it again here. It's all over my website that I, my Ph.D. is not in clinical psychology. It is in organizational psychology. However, I have a master's in counseling psychology and I've been doing this therapy stuff for 40 years and I educate myself a lot, a lot about, uh, you know, what, what we should know about the research, about what's happening. So whenever I say qualified mental health professional, that's who I want you thinking about, someone who's qualified in the area that you're talking about. Okay, I'm off my soapbox, sorry, I just get upset. I get upset? You know I do. Okay. So here are the symptoms for generalized anxiety disorder in the DSM. Excessive anxiety and worry occurring more days than not for at least six months. And that should be, it's about a number of events or activities like school, work performance, things like that, okay? Number two is the individual finds it difficult to control worry. Number three, 
The anxiety and worry are associated with three or more of the following six symptoms with at least some symptoms having been present for more days than not for the past six months. So again, you have to have these things for a period of time. Uh, but so this is like restlessness or feeling keyed up or on edge, being is easily fatigued, difficulty concentrating or the mind or your mind going blank, irritability, muscle tension, sleep disturbances, you know, that could be difficulty falling or staying asleep or restless sleep or unsatisfying sleep. Okay. All so something in there and kids, by the way, only need one of those, but I'm not going to get into child diagnoses right now. Four is the, the fourth thing is the anxiety, worry, or physical symptoms cause, um, significant distress or impairment in uh, either social situations, occupational, you know, work or other important areas of functioning. Next is the disturbance is not attributable, this is important, to a substance abuse like drugs or alcohol or another medical condition like hypothyroidism. I have to tell you that pretty much everything I just listed, I have Hashimoto's and all the things pretty much that I've listed are uh, symptoms of Hashimoto's. How do you like that? This is called a differential diagnosis, which is why a qualified professional should make the diagnosis because you don't know that. And, or when I was a drug addict, I had all the, you know, when I was a using drug addict, I'm still a drug addict. Uh, when I was a using drug addict, I had all of the, half the things I'm explaining here I had. So we, you have to be careful because a lot of diagnoses look like each other. And that's why years and years of experience matter because we can start to really tell what the difference is. If you've been a, if you've worked construction for 25 years, you're going to be able to put in a nail better than me. Even though I could put in a nail, I can do it into wood and stuff, but you're gonna just know more. You're gonna be able to even look at a wall and be able to go, oh, I know where the studs are in that because that's a this, this, and these houses were built then, and that's how it is. For some reason with, and I think people would get that. They'd go, oh yeah, that person's been doing construction for 20 years. Of course they're better at this than I am, right? Than hanging something than I would be, even something simple or building something than I would be. But for some reason with mental health diagnoses, again, I'm on my fucking soapbox. We don't think that. We're like, oh, I can go on Google and look at all the symptoms and make diagnoses. I hear people, oh, I have so many clients come in. They're like, my husband's a narcissist. It's like, no, they're not. Probably. You're saying it right now about things. Stop self-diagnosing. I swear my experience and the, that of those, you know, who've been doing this a long time matters and makes a difference. And this is also the reason I say with so much love to my therapist, a new brand new therapist right out of school on TikTok giving advice. It, it upsets me a bit because I do, I look through my TikTok sometimes and I see this stuff and it's appalling what some of these suggestions are or things they're saying because they don't know yet. It, experience really matters. I'm telling you, there's a way I can talk to someone for just a few minutes and realize like, oh my gosh, that person's borderline. I, I, can, I can tell because of how I know to look at people and what kinds of things I ask and how I do that, but that is from years of experience. So I just wanna say that. So please, that's why get help is first here. And the last symptom is the disturbance isn't better explained by another mental disorder of some other kind, you know, d d uh, extreme depression or something else, you know. Anxiety can look like a lot of things, okay? So when you get help, it's really important to get a real diagnosis if you think, but if, you, if you've already had a diagnosis, great, and you're just looking for more tools, I'm here for you. And I will say too, I'm gonna do this really quickly, that there are, there are also medications. When you get help, you can get medications. When you get a real diagnosis and medications, I can't tell you how many clients I've had who have worked, I'm thinking of three, literally off the top of my head, who I've worked with for like a year and they were doing all the things. I have to tell you, my clients are the best. They work hard, they do their homework, they do their stuff and they were not making the advances that they wanted. They were still in therapy a year later. And it's because I had been mentioning, you know, I really think you should see a psychiatrist because I cannot prescribe, I'm a PhD. Again, I'm not that kind of doctor. <laughs> I've been telling them, I need you to go to a psychiatrist. I need you to get another opinion because this is what I think, but let's get a second opinion because I could be wrong and get meds prescribed. 
And I will tell you that these three I'm thinking off of the top of my head, lives completely changed when they got on meds. Completely changed when they got on meds. They, you still have to do the work. It's not like because you get on meds, you don't have to do anything else. That's not going to get you well. It's not going to make all your anxiety go away. It's going to help some. But what the meds do is make room to use the tools. They help your brain calm down enough to remember to breathe or to do whatever the tips are. Okay. So there's a lot of medications that, you know, get used when actual, you know, an actual anxiety disorder are, you know, given, is given. Um, <clears throat> but again, always prescribed along with um, some kind of talk therapy or something else, right? And we have a lot of antidepressants that are really effective. And most of them are uh, SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. You know, there's Lexapro and Celexa and Zoloft and Paxil and Prozac and um, those are probably the most commonly prescribed I see. There's other antidepressants called SNRIs, which stands for uh, serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. They act differently. Um, Cymbalta, what are those? Yes, yeah, Cymbalta's one, Effexor's one, right? All really good. All again, your psychiatrist seeing you. You can get genetic testing done. Uh, uh, sorry, blood it's, it's a blood test. It's a, it's a genetic test, but it's like a blood test to, um, see what kind of antidepressants would work best for you. And it's possible SSRIs wouldn't work at all, which is why we would go to other things or an SNRI is better than an SSRI for you. Um, again, there's a lot of science here. And so, uh, getting a test, you know, one of the tests to see which is best for you, I highly recommend. Um, benzos are also prescribed like Ativan, Xanax, Clonopin, Valium, right? That's more for immediate relief of like a panic attack. I, these medications are highly addictive and really screw with your brain in other ways. I do not recommend benzos at all as a first line of defense. If nothing else has worked, maybe they should be used sparingly, even when they are prescribed. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I just want to say that. And the generics of all those drugs, I didn't go over all the generic names because I'm not going to do that here, but they all end in like PAM. <laughs> so if you're not sure if you're taking a benzo, if it ends with a PAM, it, it, it's a benzo, you know, um, uh, a prosilopam, you know, or no, uh, apros, alp, <laughs> a prosilum, sorry, Xanax, uh, clonazepam, so it ends in am, lamb, not am, not pam for Xanax, but you get the idea. Clonazepam for clonopin, lorazepam for Ativan, diazepam is, uh, what is that? Valium, you know, they end in pam. So if you're not sure if you got a pam or an am, pam a lamb, you know. Uh, we, uh, there's also other meds prescribed like antihistamines are really effective, visceral, hydroxyzine, um, beta blockers are sometimes prescribed like propanolol. Gabapentin is an excellent one. Gabapentin is actually, it's uh, Neurontin uh, is the trade name for GABA, which is, it's actually an anti-seizure medication. It helps your nerves conduct. It's, it's, uh, my grandmother was on, you know, Neurontin. She wasn't anxious. Uh, but uh, Gabapentin is amazing for anxiety. Really, really helpful for a lot of people. And uh, again, a lot of these drugs have very few side effects or but although some of them have a lot, you know, sexual side effects and other things. So again, really, really important to work with somebody who who's, um, knows what they're doing. So, okay, I'm off that. All right. Tip number two is mindfulness and guided visualizations. You know, to lower stress, there's nothing better than getting into a regular meditation routine. I talked about that last week, but if you've passed stress and you're anxious, if you try to go meditate when you're crawling out of your skin, it ain't gonna work. <laughs> and I hear people say this, well, go meditate. Even if you are a meditator, it's gonna be hard if, you're, if your brain has been hijacked to go meditate. So it, it can absolutely make you more anxious. And I've, act, I've seen this be especially true for people who have uh, unhealed trauma or undischarged trauma from their past. Meditation is, 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 can be especially hard and again, even damaging. So making mindfulness a habit and getting into a practice with guided visualizations is so important if you're looking to lower your anxiety. I got a free mindfulness starter kit, right? I have uh, 
guided visualizations on, I'll link to all these in the show notes. Uh, they'll all be there. But if you go on YouTube right now and put in Abby Metcalf PhD, there's a loving kindness meditation. That's a guided visualization. There's a, there's other meditations I have, negative thinking one, uh, guided visualizations on there, guided meditations. That's what they are. Same thing. You're visualizing something. Uh, those are especially, especially helpful. And I have done so much on my friggin' show on this podcast on mindfulness, give me a break. Go to the website, search term mindfulness. I'm not going to waste all our time here because I've done it a million times. There's so many. Okay. Tip number three is explosive cardio. Exercise is wonderful for stress and anxiety. It really is. But the type of exercise you do to me differs for anxiety versus stress. So, you know, Going on a long bright bike ride or a nice long run in nature is a great stress reliever. Absolutely not that I've done either of those, but I've heard. Uh, it can be, there's a great stress relievers, but not always great for anxiety because all that time to think, you know, spinning on your bike and spinning on your brain, right? Not a good idea. <laughs> not a good idea. So, a spin class would be different because there's explosive exercise here and you're being guided. You're taking a class. It's being guided. You don't have much time in your head because you can barely like breathe and stay on the bike, right? Uh, again, not that I've done these things, but I've heard. So <laughs> always great for anxiety, you know, are these explosive exercises, you, you know, you want to, you're trying to burn off the stress hormone and again, unhijack your brain. Okay. So jumping rope as fast as you can for 30 second intervals for two minutes, you know, 30 seconds on 30 seconds off 30 seconds on 30, two minutes, one minute, 30 seconds only will absolutely burn. Remember if a, if a, if you were running from a, a lion back in the day, or if you've ever seen a gazelle on the nature channel running from a lioness, they don't run long. One of two things happens. They get away or they die. They get eaten. That's it. And it, it's not an hour run. It is a minute, 30 seconds, 45 seconds, a minute and a half. It is not long. And that's all you need to do when, you, when you're going to burn off a stress hormone. But it needs to be hard, like you're running for your life. So jumping rope as fast as you can would do that. I keep a jump rope here in my office and uh, I've been known to be outside because I can't jump rope in here. Um, I've been known to be outside. <laughs> People have seen me and, um, you know, in the neighborhood and I look silly and that's fine with me. I don't care as long as I feel better. So it, it absolutely works. You know, box jumping, um, any other high interval, you know, high intensity interval training where there's short bursts of very intense cardio will do it. But that's the kind you want to be doing for anxiety versus stress. Okay. Tip number four is to use grounding techniques. Grounding exercises are evidence-based tools to help you come back to the moment instead of being caught up in your fear. So many of these techniques, they usually use like one or more of your five senses to ground you, grounding techniques, in the here and now. Because in the here and now, you're safe, right? That's where you're safe. I'm going to give you, I have a list of grounding techniques. So if you can, you can download those, all right? For free, you're going to get put on the love letter list. Yes, you are. That's what happens when you do it. Because I'm, I'm going to get you here or there. I'm going to get you to have a happy life. Whether you like it or not, I'm going to Jewish mother bossy you into it. That's what's happening now. Get ready. I got my sleeves rolled up. So. You'll get on my love letter list and you'll read it, damn it, and you'll like it and it'll help motivate you. So there. So, or again, you can unsubscribe. But um, I have a list of, of a bunch of grounding techniques that you can download to have. Uh, but they really help you come back from that rumination, you know, the negative thinking, flashbacks even. They're very, they're, they're really successful and they take seconds. They basically are decreasing the intensity of what you're feeling and helping you detach from the anxious thoughts, okay? That's why they're so good. And again, they use your senses generally in some way. Um, I'll give you a couple now. I know you don't even have to download it. I know I'm that nice. I'm that fabulous. I'm not just giving it to you. Go download my thing. Uh, I, I'm also going to give you some now. There's just more on the list, okay? My favorite one that I use is picking a color. I'll go blue. 
and then I'll look around my office and look for blue things or wherever I am, it, it, you know, and that's what I really love about it is that you can do it anywhere. You can be in a meeting at work and having um, some kind of horrible, you know, um, anxiety attack of some kind and you can just go uh, red and look around the room for red things and no one knows. So that's red. Okay, that's red. That pencil's red. That woman's wearing a red blouse. That's how you do it. Okay. And it, again, it, it brings you back. It's very effective. It sounds simple, but it's very effective. Another thing you can do anywhere, anytime is uh, pick up any object that's near you. I'll pick up my tea right now. And I would look at the tea and I'd be like, okay, it's heavy in my hand because I have a lot of tea in there. Um, this is silver. Oh, it's really smooth when I touch it. Uh, uh, oh, I can smell the tea when I put my nose near it. Jeremy Slurp, I could even taste some tea if I wanted. And then I could go into that like, oh, it's warm in my mouth and I feel it very soothing in my throat. Uh, it's a little chamomile with honey. Um, I can feel it coming down my throat and, uh, you know, like that. You And you would describe it and boom, you are in the moment. You use as much detail as you can and as many of your senses as you can uh, and you will really see a difference. Okay, tip number five, and this is a big one. Is, your, is doing vagus nerve activation. I know. Vagus is V-A-G-U-S, not like Las Vegas, okay? It's spelled differently. Your vagus nerve is basically the main orchestrator of your autonomic or, again, involuntary nervous system that we keep talking about, okay? And it's in charge, really, of your relaxed or your emergency responses that I talked about, okay? that we That's why I talked about all that, so you could understand the vagus nerve now. Your vagus nerve is the longest nerve in your body. It goes from the brainstem all the way to your to your abdomen. That's why we have gut feelings, by the way. Ha ha. Its job is to monitor and receive information about how your internal organs are functioning and to coordinate all it's, it's so important, all your body's responses to keep you safe while also warning you about any danger before you even have a chance to think about it. I know. So here you go. Let's say you're at a party. Your brain is scanning for threats, okay? Scanning for threats because it's possible your ex is going to show up, all right? But it's also scanning for safety because your best friend is also supposed to be there, you know, as moral support in case your ex has the nerve to show their face at this party, okay? If you even think you see your ex's face in the crowd, your heart might race or you might feel like you're going to throw up. There you go. Your vagus nerve is making that happen. All those anxiety responses is that, thank you, vagus nerve, okay? But then you see your friend walking towards you and your breathing slows and your body relaxes. That's your vagus nerve too. That sigh and that feeling of calm, that is also your vagus nerve doing its job. I know. So I tell clients that you can think of, you know, their vagus nerve as being kind of your body's natural volume when it's in its relaxed state, obviously not the emergency state. But again, your relaxed state is your default. That's your default, believe it or not, even though it might not always feel that way. Your body's, you know, uh, the, the drama queen response is the emergency, receipt, emergency state, right? So what's important to know is that you can activate your vagus nerves relaxed response and you can do that pretty quickly and easily through breath work and progressive relaxation exercises. And you know, as I'm talking right now, because there's so much I want to say, which I'm not, I promise we're going to end. I really, I think I'm going to do an entire episode on breathing and the vagus nerve because there's so many tips and there's so many quick and easy ways to really manage your anxiety and your stress. And they're all they come down in this vagus nerve response. So, and what's called your heart rate variability. I mean, I can get into all that in another episode. I think I will. So I'm going to, I'm going to put a pin in that right now, but let me just say here that, um, turning on your relax, that relaxed response. Okay. Is, is key. And I, well, here's what I'm going to teach you today. I'm going to teach you diaphragm, diaphragmatic, sorry, or what we call belly breathing. So right now you can do this. If you're not driving, you would place I want you to place one hand on your stomach and one hand on your chest, okay? One hand on your stomach, right on your stomach, on your tummy, uh, right in the bell of your tummy, and then the other hand up here on your, up on your chest. And what I want you to do is take in a nice, slow breath through your nose, and you should only feel the hand 
that's on your stomach rise. The hand on your chest should not be moving. I know, this is how you're always supposed to breathe, by the way, not from your chest, that's a whole other thing. And then I want you to exhale slowly, as slowly as you can through your mouth and feel your hand that's on your stomach, you know, as your stomach constricts and lays flat again, or your yours might not be flat, I don't know, um, you know, it's okay. But you know, come back down as you, right? So you breathe in, your stomach expands, you breathe out, your stomach constricts and lowers, okay? And you keep the hand on the chest to keep yourself honest and make sure that hand doesn't move. Do that three times, nice and as slow as you can, and that is gonna lower your heart rate and your blood pressure, period, end of. I know, incredible, right? So, uh, and if you come to the website, Relationship Tips and Tools page, and even the, sh the podcast page, I'll have links to a lot of different things for you, like, because I have progressive relaxation uh, things on YouTube. And again, free things, you, can, you don't even have to sign up for the love letter, uh, free things, but definitely come and get your grounding techniques because you wanna start with those. Uh, okay, wow, I feel like I've just been talking and talking because I have, but this is all really important. I love and adore you and it is not okay to live in anxiety and it is not okay not to get the help you need if you have chronic anxiety doing so i would tell you this if you really feel like i don't want to go see a psychiatrist then or you know i want i don't want to go to see a doctor i don't want to take meds or whatever fine then do what i'm laying out here do the things i've said if they don't help I really want to encourage you to go get an, a second opinion. I, you know, really a first opinion because your opinion doesn't matter. No, I say with love. You know what I mean? I, I mean like a qualified health professional opinion. Again, if you've only seen, maybe you've been diagnosed with anxiety, but it was only from your primary care physician or your general practitioner, I would really encourage you to tell your, insur you know, your insurance company that you want to go see a psychiatrist you have a diagnosis it will cover it because it has to because this is a specialty that you need um, you might need a referral from your primary care but you can talk to them and say this has been ongoing this isn't really helping i need more help i need to talk to somebody sometimes they'll send you to just therapy through your insurance um, but then the therapist can also work with a psychiatrist so there, all roads lead to rome and definitely being an actual therapy can be super duper helpful for uh, this. And these are by no means all the techniques to use for anxiety, but these are some really good ones to get you started and to understand the differences between stress and anxiety and what you do for both. All right, I love you so, so much, so, so much. Please, please practice, and I will see you next week.